So let's be real for a minute. When was the last time you were holding or maybe even looking at a project that you've made for somebody else and you could see those little ends just sticking out? I cannot even tell you how many times I have looked over at my niece who's wearing one of my hats and you can see these little frays. Nobody else notices them, but I do and it drives me insane. Hey there, welcome to episode six of Be Hooked TV. We're gonna tackle that struggle today because let's be honest, the struggle is real. I have to say there's no tried and true method, honestly, that I have found that prevents an end from completely coming out. But there are some things you can do to help prevent that. And a lot of those projects I made for my niece in the early days, I wasn't following any of these tips. And as I'm seeing those projects now, a couple of years later, I'm learning that my weaving skills weren't so great there in the beginning. But through trial and error and a few years of experience, I've picked up five tips that have really helped me weave in my ends so that they are less likely to come out, or if they do, you can only see just a little bit. That's what we're gonna talk about in today's show. I'm so excited for this one because we mentioned this in episode one, and you all were like, yes, I want to learn more about weaving in your ends. Obviously, this is a struggle that I don't face alone. You face it too. So we're gonna go through five tips for weaving in your ends so they don't come out. So if you're brand new to the show, this is the first time you're seeing an episode, welcome. It's a joy to have you here. My name is Brittany and my sole purpose for this show is to be your guide to better crochet and knitting. And whatever that struggle you are facing, whatever that might be, I would love to hear about it so that I can try to help you with it. First thing you'll wanna do is subscribe to the show if you haven't done so already. I make a new video every single Monday that is specifically to try to help you with some of these struggles. And once you do that, the, in the comment section of any of these videos, go ahead and leave your suggestion. Tell me exactly what you're struggling with. And I use that as a guide to craft future episodes. So my first tip for weaving in your ends so they don't come out is to leave yourself at least an eight inch tail. Now, I am so guilty of this. I'm sure you've seen it in my tutorials as well. I don't always do that. I don't always practice what I preach, but I do know that when I do leave myself a long enough tail, at least eight inches, that end doesn't ever work itself back out because I'm able to weave it in more. So strive for leaving yourself an eight inch tail and you'll have enough that you can weave back and forth so that it doesn't come out. Now, moving on to tip number two, this is where we need to weave in our ends under the densest row of stitches. So let's say you're working on a stitch pattern and you're not skipping any stitches or making chains or anything like that. Well, it's pretty easy. Every single row is going to be dense. For example, if you're working on a solid single crochet, half double crochet or double crochet row, you can really weave it in at the base of any of those rows and you'll find that that's very dense. However, there are some stitch patterns where it's a little more open or a little airy, maybe a little lacier, and that presents a little bit of a challenge for weaving in your ends. And that's because you have those openings there. So my recommendation and tip number two is to weave in your ends on the densest row possible. This could be a border row, it could be one or two rows above or below where your end originates from. So you don't have to weave it in directly where it sits, you can sort of work it up to a section that has a dense row of stitches so that you can weave it in and it has a better chance of staying put and not coming out. Now tip number three is one of my favorites. You've seen me demonstrate it in pretty much every single one of my tutorials. I like to weave in my ends back and forth several times, at least three times. And this is where that eight inch tail really comes into play. 
So the goal is to weave in your end back and forth so that it has a better chance of staying put. So what I like to do is weave it in under that dense row of stitches and I usually try to go up four to five stitches in one direction before I turn and go back in the other direction. Now one thing you want to make sure is that you're not putting your needle in that exact same place because if you do then you'll pretty much be undoing what you just did. So you might skip a loop or skip a part of a stitch or a whole stitch if you want as you're weaving back in the other direction so you're not undoing what you just did. Now like I said I like to do this three, four, sometimes five times. If I know that this item is going to get a lot of wear or use then you really want to make sure you go back and forth as many times as possible so that it doesn't work itself out. For example, if you know that this item will be washed or if this item has a lot of stretch to it, you really want to take care that you're weaving it in as best you can. So go back and forth as many times as you can. Okay, tip number four is one of those hidden gems. You've probably heard me mention it once or twice before, but honestly, the messier you can be, usually the better the outcome. So as you're weaving back and forth under that dense row of stitches, I find that if you split the fibers, you split the yarn and you're just kind of messy with your needle placement, it tends to stay in a little bit better. And that's because as you're splitting those fibers, it's sort of grabbing on to itself. And the way I know this to be true, I don't know if you've ever experienced this before. Let's say I already weaved in my ends and then I had to rip the project out for some reason. Maybe I found a mistake. I've done this once or twice before. If you've ever tried to unweave in your ends when you've been a little messy and split the fibers, it's kind of a nightmare. It's really not easy. And so that's how I know this particular tip is probably the best out of all five of them. So if you can split the yarn, be a little bit messy, and I think you'll see that the end is a lot less likely to come out. All right, now moving on to our fifth and final tip, factor in the stretch. You're probably thinking, what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> so when I factor in the stretch, think of it this way. A lot of our projects are going to stretch in some way, shape, or form when they're being used. So think about a hat, for instance. When you pull the hat over your head, it's stretching sort of on the horizontal. So it's stretching from side to side. Well, alternatively, you might think of a garment or a sweater. As you're pulling that on, it might stretch up and down. So factor in the stretch and weave in your ends along the opposite plane. So for example, if you're weaving in your ends on a hat that you know is gonna stretch horizontally, you wanna weave in your ends on the vertical. And that's because as it repeatedly stretches over and over, every time you put it on your head, you're not slowly working that tail out of that row of stitches. For garments, what I like to do, since I know they tend to stretch, well, they kind of stretch in both directions, we'll be honest. But if I know that a particular piece of a garment or a different type of project even is gonna stretch on the vertical, then I will weave in the ends along the horizontal. And that way, once again, I'm not just working that end out every time that project stretches. So that's it, those are the five tips to weaving in your ends so that they don't come out. Let's recap though. Tip number one, when you fasten off, leave at least an eight inch tail so that you have plenty to weave in. Tip number two, weave it in the densest row of stitches you can find. Tip number three, weave it back and forth at least three to five times. Tip number four, be a little messy and split the fibers when you do this. And tip number five, Factor in the stretch and weave in your end along the opposite plane that you know it's going to stretch. Now, let's take a minute to talk about the needles. So this is my personal darning needle collection. You don't need to have a ton, right? You really only need one or two. I have a tendency of sort of collecting them. Basically, they're different sizes, different materials, and that sort of thing. So I wanna show you what's inside. So when you look inside my darning needle collection, you'll see a variety of different sizes and a couple different types of materials. One of my absolute favorite darning needles though is this bent tip needle. And this is my bonus tip for you. Get one of these needles. I think it'll really be a game changer for you, especially if you're weaving in your ends 
where it's just not really easy to get to. Works really great for thinner yarns as well. I use this bent tip needle for absolutely everything and it doesn't really even matter the yarn size. This is kind of my go-to needle. And of course it's a darning needle, so they're super cheap. This particular one is made by Clover and they're not endorsing me to say this at all. This really is just the darning needle that I go to and that I use all the time. Now in this collection, you'll also see a plastic darning needle and I have to be honest on this one and give this kind of a harsh review. Plastic darning needles, they're just not my jam. This one came with, I believe, a loom knitting set and it's good because the eye of the needle is really large and that's great for thicker yarns. But for me, what I found is the material, the, the plastic material itself, sort of has a tendency to snag on the yarn and it's just not a very easy or fun experience. So I have this one, but I don't really use it too often. So these other varieties here, the main difference in them is the size of the eye of that needle. And I really just use these to weave in really chunky yarns on, on the bigger side, so bulky weight, chunky weight yarns. And then for these smaller ones, I have a tendency to use that for my lightweight, sport rate, and even medium weight yarns. I find that these are a really great alternative. They're super cheap. You can pick them up at your craft store for like a couple bucks, and that's really great. They served me well for many years before I found this, this bent tip needle that I just love to use. But you know, it's really all personal preference. I think if you get a variety of darning needles, you won't have much investment, but you'll be able to see what works for you. Maybe you really like the plastic darning needle. Maybe you hate the, the bent tip needle and you just like the straight ones. So whatever your preference may be, that's really the right choice for you. All right, so that'll do for today. Try at least one of these tips and tell me how it helped you in the comment section below. I know that these tips are, some of them are pretty self-explanatory, pretty obvious, but have you, have you actually tried all of them? When you combine all five of these together, I think you will see really good results. So try at least one and tell me about it in the comments section below. Okay, so that'll do for this week. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. As always, if you haven't done so, please do go ahead and subscribe to the show. And if you have a suggestion for a future episode, leave that in the comment section as well. I read through every single one of those and I use those suggestions to help craft future episodes. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.